Ready, set, go. I'm just doing what I'm I feel like that's signing a live bit with Will Ferrell right now. <laughs> Need more cowbell. <laughs> oh. Go for it. We can do it. Is that you, Ed? It was. <laughs> we all need ordinary average life. We average kids. Average ex-wife. Uh-oh. Is that you, Ed? It was. I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding practice. We are the water in the morning rain. Drink a few brewskis. Pull a few grains. We're just ordinary average guys. We're, we're like, yeah, we're like Spinal Tap trying to find our way to the stage. Take two. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we're good this time. Rock and roll. All right. Ladies and gentlemen around America, welcome to the Ag Technology Podcast Show, Unfiltered, where we make only four guarantees. Number one, you'll become a whole lot smarter. Number two, you might get stupider. Uh, more stupid? Stupider. Dumber. You might get dumber. Oh, a microphone. Number three, you might get a little more confused. Or number four, all of the above. <laughs> From California down to Florida to New York. Yeah, we just covered in corn. Yeah, we box it, stalk it, microwave and pop it. Morning after we suck it out on the front porch. Some steam it, cream it, suck it up and feed it to the chickens, cow, sows, and the wild. Let's see what these geniuses have in store today. Your hosts from Integrity Ag Group and Casper Ag Solutions. Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Heath Conklin and Ed Casper. American Croppers, the Ag Tech Unfiltered Podcast Show. Thanks for joining us here today where you're going to get a few laughs. And I promise you, with today's guest, you will learn something along the way. Your hosts here today, Heath Conklin of Integrity Ag Group and the ever-famous, illustrious Ed Casper of Casper Ag Solutions. And also joining us in the studio, we've got Taylor, the intern, Pierce, interning with Integrity Ag Group this year, the agronomy major from Murray State University. And it is my pleasure to introduce to everybody Today's guest is going to be Cody Goins from ROI Biologicals. Cody is the owner and founder of ROI Biologicals. He's located in Southern Illinois. He works closely with the growers to ensure that they make the most of educating purchases and makes decisions, focuses on maximizing on-farm profits by maximizing the biology in your soil. His products have been verified by farm trials, university data, and world record setting results on soybeans. You can learn more about soil biology and ROI Biologicals impact by following very informative blogs at ROIBiologicals.com forward slash blog. Cody also helps and assists as the co-host for the Next Level Camp and the Mid-South located in Murray, Kentucky with yours truly at Integrity Ag Group. So if you're interested in joining up, you can see Cody Goins or myself, and it is a pleasure to bring Cody on to the show today because I really think you guys are going to get a lot out of it. Cody is just a savant when it comes to soil and soil biologicals. He's just phenomenal. When it comes to it on my end, I am not. Hopefully he will enlighten myself. He will enlighten Ed to a whole new world. I used to believe was moon juice or worm sweat or snake oils or whatever you want to call it. But uh, there is a whole lot to it, and I, I do encourage you to send your questions into questions at AmericanCroppers.com, and uh, we'll try to forward those on to Cody, and he can get back to you, or you can send it to Cody. Uh, Cody has several different products available, the Exalt, Amplify, and Checkmate, three of the big ones that uh, Cody definitely recommends. But see Cody, he's going to give you a special sample uh, directed straight to your soil, uh, after looking at it under a microscope, he's very particular about what he does, and it's uh, geared specifically for you and almost a, uh, uh, I call it a prescription. I don't know that that's what it is, but uh, Cody's very specific in what he does, and 
uh, very intentional. So uh, I do recommend uh, talking to Cody about it. We're going we're to bring Cody on here in just a few minutes. So I want to give Cody a good introduction and uh, give his bio to you so you kind of know what we're going, what we got going on here. So uh, without further ado, welcome to the Ag Tech Unfiltered podcast show. All right, we've got everybody live, and we've got Ed with uh, Casper Ag. We've got Cody Goins with ROI Biologicals, correct? Yep. And uh, and Cody, we've got our uh, our illustrious intern Will Templeton. Also, he likes to be called Wilma. So when you see him, you can address him as such. And then we've also got Taylor, who is our um, an intern interviewee. And uh, she just was dying to come in to intern and uh, do that on the podcast. So that's how she's uh, in, <laughs> she's landed here. And, and I think the looks I just got were, were probably not uh, coinciding <laughs> with my words. So we're uh, testing her out live. So Cody, talk to us. Uh, tell us a little bit about Cody and uh, ROI Biologicals, uh, who you are and what you do and what you're so passionate about. So I am uh, based in Southern Illinois. I started manufacturing biological about four years ago. It was a space that we used to joke around about and call it snake oil. Tell some of uh, my dad's customers tried stuff and we got some really good yield results. I self-educated, took a bunch of courses in soil microbiology and then continued to self-educate after that and just kind of learned really the science behind what biologicals do and how they work and uh, was able to start formulating and produce final product. We, you know, field test them, had really good results. Uh, that's where we started, and we've just been blessed and able to expand from there. So that pretty much sums up in a very quick way how I got started. And, you know, now we're obviously working with next level one growers in a bunch of different states and been really blessed, had a lot of luck and a lot of good feedback. So, Cody, where, are your, where all are your products being used at currently? <laughs> um, so we would be in Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Iowa, Missouri, um, Indiana, Ohio, Georgia, and Virginia. So, handful of states. Good. I'm assuming uh, good results out of 2019, or what did you see from results out of 19? Yep. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of a lot of good results, a lot of a lot of increase in nutrient uptake, a lot of positive response as far as growing the microbiology in the soil, good yield increases. So that you know, every, everything that you'd expect out of biological products, uh, all the claims that are made, you know, they do a little bit of each, each, each thing. So 2019 has definitely gone well for us. We get to the end of this. We'll, we'll hit this again, but people are listening and they happen to hear you and they say, man, this guy is like the smartest cat in the cave. And I just got to have what Cody's putting out there. How do they get a hold of you? Where do they buy your products and, and what's the deal there? So we have a website. Um, one, of the, one of the things I really encourage people to do is to visit our website. It's uh, ROIbiologicals.com. Uh, the reason I, I say that is because we have a lot of information, just, just free knowledge um, on there. I have a blog post that covers the different different organisms in the soil and, again, just a lot of information on the science behind how and why those products work. So. Um, that's the first thing I'd want to mention is, is to encourage people to check that out. You can't ever go wrong doing a little bit of educating yourself. But we have uh, we have a dealer network. Um, so there's uh, some dealers listed on the website. And then, of course, guys can reach out to yourself, you guys there at Integrity Ag, um, to get product information and pricing. We've got Bandana Ag in Kentucky, the Volunteer Ag Services, some of the hefty stores. So most of that is listed on the website as well. So people can email me directly there if they need to. Um, I'm, I'm free to talk on the phone as much spare time as I have I will um, but as far as uh, products go we try to get people to uh, reach out to our dealers because I, I just don't have time to service everybody like that so but they can certainly reach me through my email on the website well, I really really appreciate you taking time to sit in with us today so sure now, and I know you did you and Cody work together or did you use any of Cody stuff this year no not this year so and and Cody, I know you and I got on this hot topic this morning. So <laughs> on the spacing issue. Yes. <laughs> so C Cody was asking Ed uh, on on the theory of meters, and we were explaining VSET twos and and Kinsey meters and Kinsey finger meters. And mm -hmm. uh, you want to touch on that one, or you want me to tee that up for you, or how you want to handle that? Well, what what would you like to know? <laughs> I think my my question to Heath was uh, so I'm I'm. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very transparent about the fact that I'm, I'm equipment ignorant. 
So I, I'm not a farmer, didn't grow up on a farm. So, uh, you know, I didn't learn a lot of this stuff until I got into that level group. You know, somebody was in finger meters, I had no idea what they meant. So um, my question was the precision ag stuff, you know, the V set drives or whatever it's called versus like a QZ finger meter. You know, I was just mentioning, I said, I, I know a couple growers that have QZ planers. <laughs> anyway, I noticed a lot of doubles and a lot of skips and just all kinds of stuff. And I asked Keith, I said, how, how and why is the precision meter better? I, I don't, you know, you have to explain it to me like I'm eight years old. So tell me how and why those are better. Just I've heard, I just want a further explanation. So that that was the question that I asked Keith this morning, and he, he explained a lot of that to me. So I was probably a lot less blunt than what Ed will probably be. So sure, I was probably yep. a lot more blunt. Well, in, in, yeah, in my opinion, in my experience, the finger meters are pure junk. And I've just oh, probably offended half of our audience, but I, I don't care. They're junk. Uh, that's 50 year old technology. Finger meters were introduced 50 years ago. And what bothers me is when you talk to farmers about what we're trying to accomplish here in, in emergence and spacing and stimulation and equal harvestable ears, and they're out there using 50 year old finger meter technology. And you talk to them, you say, hey, it's proven to be worth your money to upgrade your meters. Oh, I can't afford that as they roll off with their uh, trailer full of $15,000 snowmobiles as they take a three week vacation. So the, the thing you got to remember, though, is planter guys think planter parts fix everything. Chemical guys, they think chemicals fix everything. Poo-poo juice doctors, they think poo-poo juice fixes everything. Are you referring to it, powder and poo-poo juice? It's a, it's a black magic of everything coming together correctly. But the, And then people say, well, how do you know finger meters are crap? Well, I've been running meters on a test stand for 10 or 12 years. I run about 500 to 800 meters a year. So I'll do the math, 5,000 to 8,000 meters I've run on the test stand. And I've farmed with finger meters, and I've farmed with V-set, and I've farmed with V-drive. And forget it. There's no comparison. So do you have to have V-drive to, to be profitable? No, you don't. But when you start talking about how do I bring my yield up, how do I find more bushels without buying more seed, without buying more fertilizer, without paying higher cash rent, the first best place to start is a good meter. I, I know a lot of guys that are farming really well with e -sets. You can do that. You know, you don't have to have electric drive. But in terms of finger meters, and here's the other problem is every year, seed companies are pushed to find higher yields. They need to breed for higher yields. They're not breeding for plantability. They're breeding for results on the bottom line. That makes it harder and harder for us in the precision industry to find a meter that's going to handle what I call succotash, large and small, flats and rounds. You kind of, sometimes you get a little bit of everything. And especially with 2019 being such a brutal growing season, I have no idea what the quality of seed is going to be out there next year. A finger meter is not going to handle that. It ain't going to be happy. A vac planter is going to have a much, much better ability to handle that variation and still give you proper spacing and singulation. Great so point. I, I made it through that heath and I didn't even swear. I'm <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> oh, I'll be patting you on the back right now, buddy. <laughs> well, it's just things like that that bother me is no one's using 50 year old tractors. No one's got a 50, you know, they didn't have cell phones 50 years ago. All these things that people update for, for good reasons. There's a reason why our cars are different than they were 50 years ago. But yet people roll out there with finger meters thinking, oh, this is the best. And uh, I, I just, I know better. I beg to differ. But you, you, you got you to gotta be careful. I've told people that there's a lot of times that farmers are in love with their corn planter to the point where I'd have a better chance to get my hands on the farmer's daughter than I do on that planter. That's how in love they are. So when you insult their meters, you just told them that their redheaded daughter is ugly. And, and that's a tough place to be with a customer. But when you're talking pure performance, finger meters are crap. So just stop it. And I'm, and listen, I'm sympathetic to the fact I get why they're running. I'll agree with it. I'm sympathetic. I get why they're running the finger meters. They want to be able to drop the planter, hit the bull wheel on the, on the ground drive tire and plant. And, and, and I get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, precision stuff, it breaks. It, it doesn't work. I mean, if you've got a, a, a wife or a female in your life, no offense, Taylor, sorry, 
But if you've got a wife or a female in your life and you've got precision technology and electronics involved in your up farming operation, your what your life is going to suck. I mean, it just is. I'm sorry. But if you've got mechanical meters, you, you put your planter down, it's going to plant. If your end goal is to I'm, maximize the farmers that tell me they used to take, you know, the orange flag that we use for flag tests for emergence. They, they used to wrap an orange flag on the hex shaft, and that's how they knew they were that, this, that the meters were turning. They'd look back, and if that flag was going, chup, 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 that meant the hex shaft was turning, that meant they were dropping seeds. Yep. And away they go, happy as can be. Uh, Will, the intern, wants to know, why does Case and John Deere still make planters with finger meters? They're cheap to build. They're easy to build. They've already got them, and that's what customers demand because yeah. that's what they know. Do, do John Deere still put out they a finger meter? They want that new. I don't even know if they do. Kinsey does. I don't even know if Deere does. I suppose if you asked for one, I suppose you could. I suppose anything's possible. I don't know. I guess is that pretty much the same answer that I get? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I didn't know it was 50-year-old technology. I'm not shocked, but, but I didn't know it was that old. It is kind of surprising that as much as they update and as much as <laughs> you would think as a planter manufacturer, you would... <laughs> You want to switch that and outperform your competition. Like, it doesn't, yeah, I don't see the logic behind sticking with it. If it weren't for Greg Sauter and precision planting, a lot of this stuff wouldn't even exist Whoa. because everyone thought that we were doing as good as we could do. I remember when Greg first came out with Air Force and precision planting, and he would ask farmers at trade shows, How much downforce are you applying per row? And they had no idea. And he says, can you put a number to it? And they had no idea. And it's not their fault. It doesn't mean they were bad farmers. Just no one thought about it. And we had no way to measure it. So we had no way to manage it. And that is all this stuff happened because Greg's daughter started putting out. To his benefit, he started paying attention to it right about the time we started seeing four, five, six, seven, eight dollar corn. That makes it easy to invest in those things when you're writing checks December 30th to get rid of money. Uh, right. But that, that's how it, it came about. And now we're at a point where a lot of good farmers have solved those problems. Unless you've been living in a cave, there's no reason for you to not have control over spacing and simulation. And that's when we get to that next step of the emergence and harvestable year. Well, precision ag was born out of a need, right? I mean, everything is. I mean, nothing's just crapped out of thin air. I mean, at the end of the day, precision ag started back in the late mid nineties. And at the time, mm -hmm. what was the price of corn back then? Dollar 90? Gosh, uh, man, I remember in 05, I sold corn for 225 and I thought I cut a fat hog. What's funny, though, about, like you said, it, in my mind, it started with Al and Ag Leader making the first yield monitor. That's really kind of, to me, the origin of precision agriculture. And to this day, I still have folks making yield maps, and all they really amount to is expensive coasters. They set them on the table and set their drinks on that's what they use yield maps for. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a strange industry. And it goes back to my my school bus theory, which I've shared with Ed before. Cody, I don't know if I've ever told you. And this goes back to the spacing versus simulation. I think guys would get uh -huh. rid of their finger meters in a heartbeat if they had a simulation monitor. And everybody thinks, oh, I've got population monitoring. I've got monitoring. I'm good. Like, oh, you need a simulation monitor. Like, oh, I'm good. I mean, do you guys know the difference? My interns, I'm looking at them. Do you guys know the difference between simulation? Yep. Uh, and, and a lot of the population may not. Our audience might be a little bit more defined. They might. But I don't know what the percentage of the ag population does have simulation versus just population. But if you knew the difference and you had the metric, I bet you would throw your stinking finger meters in the trash. And I'm pulling an head here and trying not to swear either. But uh, Peyton, my daughter, who's 11, no, it's 12. She'd kill me if she listened to it. She'd be like, Dad. But she rides some, she, I drive her to school every day. So if, if I didn't drive her to school every day and she had to ride the bus for one time, she would suddenly appreciate the fact that I drive her to school every day. Right now, she doesn't give a rat's rear end that I drive her to school. She could care less. But if one day she suddenly had to ride the bus, all of a sudden, no dad would be pretty awesome because he drove her to school. So the same thing, if all of a sudden these guys got a simulation monitor and saw that their, their spacing and their, their simulation sucked and they were throwing doubles, 
all of a sudden they would stop that planner and go get different meters or do something about it and make a change. So, and that's how Greg's daughter made his money was he said, you want to pay for those new kitchen cabinets for your wife? You want to get that pickup truck? You want to go to Disneyland? Where's that money going to come from? It's going to come from the gains you're going to receive from facing simulation and emergence. That hit home with people. That hit them right the checkbook. That's where you've got to hit farmers before they'll change. People don't change until they feel pain. Human beings are not going to change until they feel pain. And when you see Farmer Bob across the fence getting a new this and a new that, and you're not, and you see him investing in this kind of thing, this kind of technology, and you're not, that hurts. And that's what gets guys to just start to want to make a change and, and make investments in their planner to get better. Now, my question for Cody is, what we've talked about is, after 2019, um, up in northern Illinois, I don't care what the temperature is. If the ground is fit, we are going to plant. But what are we going to do, in your opinion? Let's say the planter is tuned to perfection. How much do you think, uh, what are biologicals, what are in furrow, sugars, what are those going to do for us to help protect our emergence to get that crop up within 12 GDU? Sure. As far as the biologicals go in furrow, you know, I'm not saying we're going to overcome way too cold conditions. We're not going to overcome horrible saturated cold trip scores, right? Like, you know, the basics have to be checked off. That being said, one of the main things that we see uh, with the biologicals is stimulating germination just by themselves. So humic acids, kelp extracts, both of those things, which are in the, you know, the majority of our products, obviously, stimulate germination by themselves. So uh, there's a few different ways that they can do that. Some of them are gibberellic acid-like compounds that are in the kelp extracts that just plain old induce germination. Uh, some of it is because of the fact that humic acids buffer salt indexes. You know, the higher your fertility is, the higher DC is going to be in your soil, which is basically the salt index. Salinity really inhibits amylase, which is the precursor to germination. So when the humic acid buffers that salt index, it's going to let amylase do its thing in full force. So amylase is in the seed, obviously, certain temperature, once it imbibes water, that's going to go to work breaking down starches into maltose and glucose. So long story short, salinity, any kind of the salt level, the higher it is, the more the, the tougher that is to happen. And it's definitely more sensitive than soybeans than corn. So just the, the germination enhancing effect of those is one of the key things. The other thing is those humic and kelp extracts are going to be the beneficial organisms. Uh, when your beneficial organisms increase and their population increases, they're just going to be natural competitors of the disease-causing organisms. You have low biology, low numbers of good bacteria, fungi, those diseases don't have much competition. I mean, they're all competing for carbon and for food sources. So um, the more beneficials you have, the more natural competition you have against the, the pathogen, the less disease pressure you're going to see because of that. Along with that come things like induced systemic resistance and systemic acquired resistance. Kelp extracts and humic both have been known once, uh, uh, once they come in contact with like the root to prompt that. So they do that through chemical signaling. That plant is almost going to go in deep, defense mode very early. Um, and it's interesting. There's a, a few different things that can cause that, but uh, helix and kelp both certainly do that. And there's, you know, other humic acids will do it. I'm, don't misunderstand. It's not like we have the only humic acids in the world that are going to do that. That's just humic acids by nature. I don't care who it is. So um, that being said, you know, feeding beneficial organisms, inducing germination, uh, those are two of the, the key things that that's, that that's going to do for you in furrow as far as germination and me, is concerned. And let me bounce this off you because up here we had seven inches of snow and 25 degrees low temperature on April, I think, 27th. Now, I pay real close attention, and I do a lot of custom spraying. So I'm driving all over the countryside all summer up high, and I get to, you know, I get I get the, the bird's eye view of what these crops look like. And we had one farmer down the road. He planted uh, four or five days before the snowfall in very good soil condition. We had another farmer, he planted 24 hours before the snowfall in cold temps in very good soil condition. Uh, we had another farmer up the road who planted 24 hours before the snow 
in clumpy, cloudy, wet conditions. The first two guys ended up with really nice looking corn, a really good stand. And these aren't, these aren't foo-foo juice guys. There's no inferral on their sure. planters. Sure. The guy who planted into poor soil conditions, uh, it, was, it, it wasn't pretty. Yeah. Right. It, it, it wasn't good to look. And unfortunately, it was right on a state highway. And we all had to look at it all year long. Sure. Now, after that snowfall, the ground was wet and 46 degrees or colder for three weeks straight. Okay. Now, one thing, and we're going to, we'll bring our Bex uh, agronomist on this show later. He's just dynamite. I really enjoy working with him. And, and I think he's right. Tell me if we're wrong. But he said, Ed, you can have everything you want. Mother Nature doesn't flip the switch until, what is it, 50, 52, 55 degrees? And I said, I agree, Ben. I get that. You're right. You can't put products in furrow and say, no, Mother Nature flipped the switch at 40 degrees. It doesn't work that way. That's so, that's correct. Yeah, you're not. Yeah. So are you saying to me that the products that you're talking about, if we've done the planter correctly, uh, when Mother Nature says, Okay, 50 degrees. If you're, you know, smoke them if you got them, boys. Your yep. products are going to help that plant imbibe water equally and help that plant to kickstart what Mother Nature put in there to begin with. Is that what you're, what you're saying to me? Yes. Yeah, that's why I was saying, you know, the first thing I said was you're not going to overcome way too cold of stuff conditions, right? Like you just said, we're not going to take Mother Nature on and your corn going to emerge when the soil 40 yep. degrees, right? Like, absolutely yep. not. Um, once those organisms do start to come to life, uh, once the temperature warms up, they have a food source there, right? They have carbon, readily available food, micronutrients that their population is going to start increasing a lot more rapidly uh, right around that seed than, you know, what, if you didn't have anything like that out there. So that that's my main thing. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to help it imbibe water necessarily, but as soon as that, um, you know, as soon as that, germination does start that radical starts to come out the root starts to come out you know they're gonna they're gonna ride into active organisms active uh, higher populations of microorganisms compared to an untreated section now in your opinion so if we've got farmers out there listening and they're going yeah sure for 50 bucks an acre i can put all this in <laughs> you have a rough estimate of if you were to prescribe or if you were to write a prescription for a guy to get him some of these things what's he looking at cost per acre yeah so um you know we we try to base that all on uh we do a lot of biological assessments where um you know we'll look at the soil under the microscope and see what's missing before we try to recommend rates and products but generally speaking you gotta spend anywhere from four to sixteen dollars an acre for a for a solid intro program um Mm -hmm. you know four dollars an acre is going to get you a quart of a good product in furrow. Sixteen dollars per acre is going to be more like two quarts of a good product and and a and a, a good inoculant with it. You know, it depends on your yield goal, your your practices, what you've used, and not used, and you your biological assessment. We try to take all those things in consideration when we're making a recommendation. Now, when I was in college and getting my master's degree, my finance professor and I got some pretty good friends. He's a pretty good guy, and he's since passed away, but he and I would always sit down a couple times a year and he wanted to know what I was up to and how I was doing and blah, blah, blah. And, and there's two things he said to me that stuck. Um, one was a, a business I was in before. I was always pushing the throttle as hard as I could. And I can remember we're sitting there at lunch and he put his hand down on the table and he said, Ed, he says, it's bottom line. It's always bottom line. He says, you guys get out there rocking and rolling and you think it's top line, top line, top line. He says, it's not. It's bottom line. He says, your top line's taller, but your bottom line isn't better. He says, you got to change that. And And he's right. And I remember that. The other thing he told me was he always went back to the eat well, sleep well proposition. He says, Ed, you're self employed. He says, you can have steak and lobster for dinner every night of the week. But if you do that, you're not going to have enough money to pay for all the insurance that you want or that you need 
to run that business. And that's fine. Your belly's going to be happy, but you're not going to sleep well. Now, he says, if you go and buy all the insurance to protect yourself from this, that, and whatever, you're going to sleep like a baby, but you're not going to have money for surf and turf every night. You might eat macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. So it's the eat well, sleep well. And do, do you prescribe to that in terms of your products? Because I do. When I talk planter components and planter setup, you're essentially buying insurance. When you buy Delta Force, you're buying insurance. You're buying a little bit of control. When you go to V Drive versus Finger Pickup, you're buying control. You're buying insurance. How do you see your products working into that spectrum? Um, yeah, I, I would definitely be on the same page. I mean, when, when we talk about, if you just do something as simple as Google humic acid benefits, right, you'll see like this ridiculous grocery list of 50 different things that it does. And, you know, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, honestly, you know, I, I see about five key things that are happening. You get better nutrient uptake. And, and to be clear, you don't get every one of these every time you use it, right? So sometimes you get some, sometimes you get one another, sometimes only one thing's going to happen. It's that giant, insane matrix of variables that, that ultimately uh, contribute to your yield. So that being said, I see, uh, we see very, very consistent increased nutrient uptake. Um, for example, if you use one to two quarts of product in furrow, you take a V3 to V4 tissue test compared to an untreated section, I'm going to bet you nine times out of ten, you're going to have good in, increased nutrient uptake on nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, zinc, magnesium, at least six or seven different nutrients. When we take that to yield, if you didn't see a yield difference, clearly none of those nutrients at that growth stage were a limiting factor. Similar, you know, if you get better emergence in one place than the other, where you, just where you happen to check treated versus untreated section, you don't see yield difference. Well, there was more than likely water or a nutrient that was your limiting factor. So, um, you know, when you have a product, uh, product like ours, I feel like we have, we really more often than not see yield increases because usually we get two, three, four different things happening and one or four of those is going to contribute to yield. And it's just going to depend on the year. You know, are you going to get two or three bushels? Are you going to get seven? Are you going to get 20? Um, you know, we've seen all those scenarios. So it's going to vary year to year, but I'm very, very confident that as a five year average, if you tested it, uh, you'll check it every time that the majority of the time as an overall average, definitely going to get a good return on investment with them. And that's just anything. I, I, yeah, buy an insurance. And I feel the same way about a good hybrid. It's not going to be the best on your farm every year. You know, absolutely not. But if it's in your top, you're going to plant it until the company discontinues it. So it's the same thing. We're not always going to win. We're not always going to uh, blow away a competitor or an untreated check in a side-by-side, -side, but as a five-year average, I, I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't firmly believe that it, that it provided a good return. It's like you're saying, is the good insurance policy. So um, what kind of yield increase are you seeing from the biologicals, like on average, from if everything else is in a perfect scenario happening? Sure. There's a, a few factors, you know, in our area. So where I'm at, Southern Illinois, you know, average of like a 2% organic matter, uh, probably about 11 or 12 CEC with uh, low to low to average fertility. A situation like that, when we use full rate of, of an infer liquid plus an inoculant, I mean, we, we're commonly going to see anywhere from 7 to 12 bushel on corn and about usually 3 to 8 bushel on soybeans. Uh, just from an interfero standpoint. And like I said, sometimes you'll see a zero or a one uh, or a 15 on corn or, or an 11 on beans. Um, but as an average, I would say we're more into three to three to six, three to seven on, on soybeans and seven to 12 on corn. So Cody, so we're going to flip the, the script around here for a second because you know, you openly admitted that when it comes to planners, I forget how you exactly phrased it. I said, I am, I am mechanically ignorant on, on all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. there, there you go. All right. So uh, when it comes to biologicals, I am, uh, what's the word, scientifically ignorant? Well, yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> all right. So we'll, we'll go with that. And uh, so, and I'm going to go into the assumption that A, most farmers are smarter than Heath on this. And, and I could be correct and I could be wrong. I don't know. But I'm going to operate under the theory that there is at least one other Heath out there that is going to listen to this and say, what the hell is he talking about? And sure. 
Give us the Cliff Notes version, or in this case, we'll call it the Heath Notes version of Cody Sells Biologicals. What in the heck is it? Sure. You know, we're obviously seeing the the why. The why is pretty simple. Yes, it's something to do in simply in my interpretation of it. We need to do something for the soil and the soil conditioning and put some of these living uh, healthy little fellers down in there and, and make it better and make the fertility grow. Sure. Yep. So the, the way that I would explain it best without trying to get too complicated is you got it. You have to pay attention to a little bit of just basic soil biology. Um, you know, if you were to go out to the to a forest that's never been fertilized and pull a soil sample, you're going to see really low levels of, of most all the nutrients. And it's like, how does this tree continue to accumulate biomass year after year? and sequester all these nutrients, there's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all the nutrients in the in the bark of the tree um, and in the tree itself. Like that's been sequestered, has not returned to the soil. So obviously they're getting it somewhere. So um, the basics are our soils are full of fertility, full of all the different nutrients that, that we would need, thousands and thousands of nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, you know, they're all there. Every soil on the earth has enough nutrients in it to, to grow plants for hundreds and hundreds of years without any outside fertility just the way the earth was created um, and designed and if you look under a microscope you'll see four main groups of organisms you'll see bacteria fungi protozoa and nematodes and just like in ecology where you've got deer and coyotes and you know predators and prey right same thing happening in the soil you've got predators you've got prey and the bodies of bacteria are about 17% nitrogen, along with a lot of other nutrients in their, in their shells. It's not in the plant available form until a protozoa comes along and consumes it and excretes plant available nutrients. Similar to the way an earthworm eats their poops out nutrient rich soil or waste. That's always going on in the soil. Different microbes will harvest different nutrients for the plant. What we've done in our ag soils is you know, we've killed extensively for a long, long time. We use fungicides, herbicides, all those things are hard on microbes. They need very pure water. So salt and fungicides and chemicals really are hard on them, and, and the tillage really wipes out the fungi. Our soils are basically, if you land level a soil, you take a bulldozer to the rainforest, it grows like crap. And it's like, why? Because, you know, the rainforest has tons of organic matter in the top half into the soil, and it, it's so productive. Things convert to organic matter so fast. You land level it with a bulldozer and try to grow crops out there, and it sucks, even though you get regular rains. And it's like, why? Because when you scrape that soil away, you scraped away all the good microorganisms that were on the top of that soil, the top portion of that soil. And then you put a field to grade, right? I mean, you take a big chunk of top soil off, and it sucks. Because you've taken all the biology out. You've taken the bacteria, uh, protozoa, especially the fungi, and any good nematodes. Products like ours uh, are just a bunch of different carbon sources and nutrients uh, that'll feed those organisms. The carbon that used to come from them breaking down plant material when all the organisms that are supposed to be there are there and recycle it into organic matter, they get carbon out of that. But when when there's missing links in that microbial chain, that, that's not happening. You know, we can't build organic matter. We're 100% reliant on synthetic fertilizers. So when you feed the biology, when you inoculate back into the field what needs to be there, what's missing, and you feed it, you give it easily digestible, accessible carbon and, and other nutrients um, in the form of things like humic, folic, kelp. Those populations are going to increase big time and they're going to start to cycle more nutrients. Um, things that are showing low on a pool test, you know, those organisms can get the locked up stuff out of the soil and pass it right onto the plant. Essentially, we're, we're just putting back what should be there, what we have destroyed over long periods of time, and we're feeding it with different carbon sources. So those are going to fix nutrients for the plant. They create antibiotics for the plant. They make growth hormones like oxygen, cytokine, and give back to the plant. So a lot of different things that they do. That's why I always hear people at the website to try to read the blog and explain a lot of that. That was probably way more in depth than what you were asking for, but <laughs> I struggle to, to really make that very simple because it's not. I get it. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. The, uh, and that's why farming's not easy, and that's not why everybody farms. That's right. I mean, it's you got biology, you got biological, you got seed, you got soil types, planters. I mean, yeah, it's, there's so many variables. Yeah, but you got bankers, you got yeah people that. Break it down to the heath level and and the and the planter level, uh, which I believe is sure. the every man farmer level too. Uh, so, sure. what is the, you have a bunch of little bunch of little bugs in your soil? <laughs> I love it. Harvest 
harvest unavailable nutrients and pass them to your plant. So instead of you having to put on NPK, copper, iron, zinc, manganese, magnesium, molybdenum, iron, all those different nutrients, if you feed your little bugs, they'll harvest it from the soil and give it to your plant for you. <laughs> So how do we, when we go to tank mix this, is there, is there any tanks mi- tank mixing issues and limitations? Um, and what about placement? Can we run that through anything? Do we want that on top of the seed, under the seed, in the seed? I prefer to treat every square inch. So we really like to start things off with a broadcast application. Like you put it in with you burned out. You're going to tank mix with any of your chemicals for sure. The only thing that you wouldn't want to do is take a human controlled acid and dump it straight into an inductor with something like Roundup. <laughs> Sometimes direct contact like that, they can gel up, but they're going to tank mix absolutely fine. So humic acid and sugar do not mix directly. That will set up. So long chain carbon, short chain carbon will come together and, and make a nice hard gooey material. So humic acid and sugar in direct contact is a no-no. It's fine as tank mix. Chemicals are fine. We put it straight in with 32%, uh, 28004, ATS, anything like that. In 340, you know, we're going to be able to go straight in the tank with those things. Jumping backwards again, we like to start with uh, something pre plant just as a, like a broad acre amendment to just feed every square inch of that soil. It's going to move down the profile with rain. Uh, we like to come back in furrow with another one to two quarts of product. Just And it doesn't matter if it's totally tubular going in the trench or if it's going through the seed firmer on top of the seed. Um, I would prefer through the seed firmer to, to actually physically coat, kind of coat that entire seed, so to say. We certainly do a lot of it the other way, just totally tubular in the trench under the seed. Yeah, it doesn't really matter how you put it in a furrow, but we like that concentrated. Same concept as banding fertilizer. You're going to be banding your biological to put them in furrow. You're going to have more concentrated dose right there where the seed is and where it's going to start its life. We'll come back with uh, some humic in our in our 32% to help as stabilizer. And when we're foliar feeding, especially with nutrients, we like to pair that with humic. Um, it's just going to help the nutrients absorb better into the plant. Uh, you're going to get more out of your foliar feeding uh, when you pair it with a humic versus if you just, just use like a chelate or a, or a sulfate-based nutrient by itself. Uh, just a quick question, but humic versus fulvic. Humic versus fulvic. Humic acid, all humics contain fulvic by nature. So if you were to mine humic acid, they're going to contain fulvics in there. So fulvic acids are just like humic, except it's a much smaller molecule. It actually has a higher CEC, lower carbon lower carbon content than humic, but a higher oxygen content. So it's going to be able to hold more nutrients than humic would. Help, uh, it's going to help more with translocation. And it can deliver things all the way to the mitochondria itself. So that oxygen is almost like more of an energy punch for the plant. Um, the humic acid, though, uh, is going to stimulate the, the soil fungi more than what folic acid would. Our product amplifies humic and folic acid. It's a humic acid that just by nature has a very high folic acid content. So when we foliar feed, we get all the benefits of, of the fulvic. Um, and then anything that, that makes it down to the ground, which um, it will, even if it's not till after harvest, that, that plant litter is going to make it to the ground. The humic is going to feed the fungi more. And your fungi do a lot more of converting to organic matter than the net residue digestion than what bacteria actually do. Our field just happen to be very, very, very low or void of it. Humic, smaller molecule, better translocation, higher oxygen. Humic still has a very high CEC, but it, it stimulates the fungi in the soil a lot more than what fulvic acid does. So that that's really the main two differences, and, and we use both because we kind of feel like why why just use one? Um, it, it's more expensive to separate the fulvic from the humic and use it as a standalone, and then you don't get any of the you don't get as many of the soil benefits as you do with humic when you're using fulvic acid. That that's really the, the only difference in the two. And here, here's what I did last year, and this was a result of listening to Randy, but I normally ran 6.46 with zinc and furrow, and, you know, he, he kind of pushes you to evaluate your ROI, and I just went with the decision last year that I was better off to spend that money on chicken manure application rather than 6.46. So are you seeing your, your product – yeah, are you recommending water as a carrier, or do you not mind the 624 sticks, or how, how do you look at that? 
Uh, again, it's going to depend, you know, what are your phosphorus to zinc ratios? Are you, are you planting when it's really cold? Um, is that is that early dose of, of uh, available phosphorus in soil really going to help or not? You know, soil temperature has a lot to do with that. You know, typically we're using it in with water. We've got a couple of customers that use like a kind of a high rate of 318 in furrow and they fix it directly with that, which is fine. I mean, it, it is going to help the phosphorus product if you're using a 6.46 or something like that. It's going to help that phosphorus be taken up into the into the plant, no doubt about that. But just being next level, I would rather people focus on what you just said, uh, chicken litter or something like that. Uh, fixing feed to zinc ratios in the soil broad acre rather than a uh, you know, few gallons of starter and throw. I've kind of changed my perspective with you there since being part of that level. So. Are you allowed to talk about Exalt, Cody? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I can. Are you talking about the, the record? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know yeah. where to go with that. So, so Randy used our products this year. You know, he was he, he told me when I met him that he was interested in seeing some labels and, and he asked me, like, what's in that product? And I, I rattled it off real quick and he's like, I want to try some of that. And I said, really? Okay. So he, he started with it in the spring. Long story short, he, he used fairly high rates of some of our stuff on different plots and different trials. I don't know the exact rate of salt that was on his, on his world record plot, but I do know he called me and told me to keep it under my hat. But I mean, it's been released now, but he said, I just want to let you know your product is on a new world record for soybeans. And I was like, are you serious? And he said, yep. I was like, wow. I mean, I, I was confident <laughs> in my product, but, cool. you know, and, and certainly I would never, ever lead anyone to believe that that's why he got a world record. You know, I mean, Randy did a million different things that contributed to that, obviously. But uh, the product that he used was Exalt, and that is a combination of humic acid, help extract, um, some, a couple enzymes. Uh, we've got some amino acids, cobalt, poison, and zinc in there. It's something that the kelp provides a lot of natural plant growth hormone, especially oxygen and cytokinin. So it's going to help with the root mass, it's going to help with branching, it's going to help with just stress mitigation in general. That kind of our, our staple product, you know, amplifies the backbone of everything, just the humic and folic acid. Uh, amplify it in exalt, but it, it's also got the extras, uh, the kelp extract and everything else. Uh, but, so we've had really good results with that. We've had some, some honestly, some really good yield increases. I don't have all my data from this year even yet. I'm waiting for people to email me stuff. But, but yeah, we've had tremendous luck. And, and Randy said that he applied it, I think, five different applications total. Um, some of it, a lot of it was through the pivot. Um, I, I don't know how many sprayer applications there were, but a lot of it was to the pivot to, to his soybeans. I, I often tell people that, you know, soybeans are not as, hot, as tolerant to salty soils or, or salinity as what corn is. And uh, when you've got sky-high fertility levels, even when you've got water, sometimes that bean can be experiencing a little bit of drought stress. And uh, the kelp, kelp extracts have, have compounds called betaines in there that really help a lot with that. And that was why um, I had wanted Randy to try and use it because I was like, I just have a theory that that's going to help. That being said, you know, we use on corn and beans, so we use on corn and furrow and foliar and, and beans in the same way. So that there's a there's a good description on the website of that as well. Anytime somebody emails me for information, I'll send them a product guide. And it's got probably more literature than anyone would care to read, but it, it explains the results um, very in-depth. Again, somebody reaching out via email, like I can send more information rather than rattling on for an hour about it. So there's so that's it, and obviously we've had, had some real good results. So, Cody, congratulations on that. I'm really, I mean, of anybody I know, you deserve the, the success, so I'm really, really proud for you. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, My wife and I always wonder where all the blessings come from, not where all the blessings come from, but why. We're like, man, we've had this has been a tremendous year, and God's been really good to us. It's been a pleasure to work with you. So, You too. It's been fun. I, I actually, I love this group. I love it to death. Yeah. My wife probably goes nuts sometimes with <laughs> I know how preoccupied I am with it, but uh, I, I love it. I've learned so much from Randy and David and from the group. It's been awesome. Yes, it's a lot of fun. Cody, we're going to have to have you back on again. I mean, you've been a uh, tremendous wealth of knowledge, and, and I appreciate you really uh, making me feel like an idiot. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. Oh, no. no. <laughs> I, I, I do not know everything. Far, far from it. I just, I'm just a nervous biologist. That's all. We have the smart one in Cody, and then we have Ed, who's a step below that, and then, uh, you know, sliding down the scale, you, you land on old Heath, so. 
Mongo. Please go, Mongo. <laughs> oh, <damn> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've effectively ran uh, way over time, so we're going to uh, put Michael. I told you. I told I you cut it in half. Hey, quiet from the peanut. <laughs> I told you to see, but you did an issue. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't even come close. <laughs> so yeah, I know we, uh, we got a whole lot more to cover. I'm probably pretty guilty. <laughs> I can't. Uh, uh, yeah, I would be fired as a preacher. There's no doubt. <laughs> well, you and I get together for lunch and, it's, uh, lunch and supper together. <laughs> oh, yeah, pretty much. Might as well go to a buffet. Let's just, let's go back up after the four hour combo. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing you next week, man. I, I can't wait. So. You too. Yeah, I'm trying to get a, get a group there Monday. Learn, learn more about equipment. The precision egg. Well, yeah, well, Cody, I really again appreciate you coming on, and uh, Ed, we'll we'll yeah, thank wrap, you. wrap her up. And uh, uh, Cody, where can yeah, they uh, you, where can they reach you, or where do you want to, what contact info do you want out there for everybody to get a hold of you? Um, so my my direct email, uh, just email Cody C O D Y at R O I Biological dot com. Um, feel free to hop on the website R O I Biological dot com and uh, and check that out and read stuff and. If you're nerdy like me and interested and want more information or pricing or anything like that, just let me know where you're at, your location, and, and we'll try to get you set up with your closest retail. But as far as technical questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer anything about biology or products. Uh, I'll, I always respond with plenty of info. So. And if you have any questions for Cody, too, you're more than welcome to email questions at AmericanCroppers.com, and that'll hit both Ed and I, and we can definitely forward those on to Cody, and we'll have him on again at some point, and we'll pass those on to Cody, and he can be sure to answer those in a, uh, with a little bit of prepared time to maybe make it a little bit more difficult for us to understand the next time. Yeah, yeah, I will try. <laughs> All right, Cody, <laughs> thanks so much, and uh, Ed, we'll uh, until yeah, next time. thank you. Thank you, sure. everybody. Thank you, man. You guys, have a good one. Right on. Taylor, Will, thanks, guys. Appreciate it, everybody. Have a Thank good night. If you're offended by anything within our podcast, please feel free to contact our management team. Uh, guys, we don't have a management team. But if you have some valuable feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us at unfilteredag at americancroppers.com. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Ed or Heath or any of our guests, feel free to send us an email to questions at americancroppers.com. There's no easy way out. There's no shortcut. Have a great day and keep moving that needle, America. God bless.